Well, welcome to everyone uh, joining us. Uh, welcome everyone to join us here in the church today and those joining us via Maria Vision and via YouTube Live. You are watching Mass here in beautiful Naples, Florida at St. Elizabeth Seton Catholic Church. I'm Father Casey Jones, the pastor, and I'm blessed to be here today with all of you. No matter how you're joining us, whether you're here in person or whether you're watching, uh, know that ultimately you're here because God's called you to be with us in this moment right now. One thing you'll notice in our church that we love to hear is the sound of babies crying uh, because it means they're here and it means our church is growing. So we're blessed to be baptizing uh, four children today. Uh, and uh, I think one of them is, is she the one being vocal right now? Good for her. You feed, feed, good. feed the baby. Good. You know, the Irish say if the, the, there's an Irish saying that if the baby doesn't cry, the devil doesn't leave. So it's just an expression. There's no devil in these children. Lord have mercy, I'm going to get some letters now. Dear Bishop Dwayne, just kidding, but not really. Uh, I'm glad to have you all here today. If you're looking for seats, there's plenty of seats in this, like, this section here and that section here. I just hate to see young families, or families, especially ladies and children, standing, so you don't have to if you don't want to. Uh, welcome. We're glad that you're all here uh, with us today, and we're glad to have you. So here we are. We are in the third week of Easter. Uh, I can't believe it's been three weeks since Easter. It seems like we just had Easter, you know, uh, and I'm still recovering from Easter. Uh, so it's been three weeks for us, but in the gospel readings we've had consecutively have all been readings from events that have taken place on Easter Day. And so now here we are, this beautiful, famous reading of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Now Emmaus is a city that is situated seven miles outside of Jerusalem. And the account of the story we get is from the Gospel of St. Luke, which is very important. Because if you remember, we, we read last year specifically, and as we do in the lectionary cycle C, a lot from the Gospel of Luke. And one thing that happens in Luke's Gospel consistent, consistently is that for almost, for over half of it, Jesus and his apostles are traveling to where? Jerusalem, right? They're traveling to Jerusalem. Towards Jerusalem, where the events of the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus will take place. To where the very center and heart and life of the early church is, of the first Christians are. But here we are, after all of these events have taken place, after the passion and death of our Lord, and after some of the first accounts, the first murmurings, if you will, of his resurrection, and now we have two of his disciples not going towards Jerusalem, but walking away from Jerusalem. Walking away from the church, if you will. Walking away from Peter and the rest of the eleven. Not really knowing where they're going. And Jesus meets them on the way, which shows that the Son of God enters into our reality. He enters into our lives, even at the moments where we might be wandering far from him, where we might not know where we're going. You know, so if you're in church today and you don't have life figured out, welcome to the club. If you're struggling, if you're strained, if you're having doubts, you're in good company. The Lord desires to meet us where we are. You know, we talk, there's a lot of talk in the church today, especially from our Holy Father, Pope Francis, about how the church needs to accompany people. We need to recognize where people are and meet them at that location, which is what Jesus did. So as Jesus is walking along the way, he's uh, eavesdropping, basically. Have any of you ever eavesdropped before? Yes, you have. We've all done it. I find myself, I do it a lot, actually, because uh, I go out in public places by myself a lot, you know, and so it's always fun to listen to some conversations that are going on around me. I remember one time I was in a bar, restaurant, establishment, <laughs> and there was someone kind of in an adjacent seat to me, uh, and they were entering into a religious discussion. And one of the things he was saying, you guys who know me know, could see how this would set me off, he was saying, well, you know, Jesus was a son of God. Uh, he goes, you know, but Buddha wa was a son of God, too. 
And I kind of looked up and I said, actually, Buddha never claimed divinity. And he, he looked at me and says, no, trust me, I, I know what I'm talking about. I've studied these things. I said, okay, if you say so. <laughs> but yeah, or have you ever been in such a debate with someone that you kind of forget where you are for a moment? You know, or you're getting into like a, a heated phone conversation, you forget to take your turn into the Starbucks drive through uh, I think this is the kind of talking that's going on here on this, on this trip to Emmaus. Because, I mean, they're not just casually talking. They're starting to debate. And Jesus is listening to them, and they're wrong. <laughs> they're wrong about a lot of things. First of all, they, they completely don't know who Jesus is. They said he was a prophet, a great prophet. Jesus didn't claim to be a great prophet. And then they had a false hope, the wrong idea of Jesus. They said, we were hoping he would be the one to redeem Israel. In other words, they were hoping for a political Messiah. And frankly, friends, we still have that going on in the world today. People that see Jesus as some sort of political activist or social justice warrior instead of the eternal son of the living God who is more it was about more than just social justice it's a part of it a huge part of it he's about divine justice and even more so thank God about divine mercy receiving the grace that he longs to give us and then thirdly so they were they were wrong about Jesus they had false hope and then they, they doubted the resurrection they said oh well some of these women are saying things now. Sex is a much. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, maybe the other disciple was a woman. I, I don't know. We only know that one of them was Cleopas. Uh, I like to believe, like the church, some of the church fathers did, that the second, the second disciple actually may have been St. Luke. Because you know, otherwise, how would he have known about this account to write it down? Just a thought. But they doubted the resurrection. You know, even, even when Peter, you know, they, okay, they, they dismissed the account of the women, but they even said that when, you know, when some of the others went, they didn't know whether to believe them. And again, friends, the resurrection of Jesus is the hinge point of our faith. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, we, there's no point in us being here. Go home, play golf, go to brunch at your country club. It's much better than what we're serving here, unless Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That makes all the difference in the world. Our, our school students put on the, the production of the, the past two nights, Godspell. Amazing production. It was done very well, and our kids know who Jesus is. They know the power of the resurrection. But as I was watching Godspell, I noticed that there's no explicit resurrection scene in it. I was like, hmm. So I went back and I looked and I saw the testimony of, 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 of the person who, who wrote it. And of course it was in the 70s, you know. Um, I was born in the 70s, so I can make jokes about the 70s. Uh, I was barely born in the 70s, but that's beside the point. Uh, he said, you know, it was really more important. We wanted to focus more about what Jesus said and did than on the resurrection. That's not really important. It's not important. <laughs> Friends, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historical reality. Jesus Christ defeated death and destroyed the grave. He destroyed sin. He rose victoriously from the dead. It was a real historical event. It's not just us remembering. Otherwise, Jesus would be one among dozens, hundreds, thousands of men that died for righteous causes and lived good lives and lived as moral teachers. Jesus is the Son of God. And this is why as Jesus is walking with these people and he hears their terribly inaccurate opinions about him, you know what he says to them? He says, please keep wandering around in your disbelief and your ignorance for who am I to judge? That's what he said, right? Is it? That's not what he said? He didn't say, you have your religious truth and I have my religious truth and that's okay, and I'm okay, and you're okay, and that's okay. Did, did he say that? No, no, he didn't. Jesus loves them. 
And he was walking with them on, the, on this journey, but he loved them too much to let them keep wandering in their own error and in their own ignorance. So the first thing he does is he rebukes them. Did you catch that? And he said to them, oh, how foolish you are. Ouch. How slow of heart you are to believe all that the prophets said. So first he rebukes them. Then he corrects them. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them what referred to him in the scriptures. Now, I've got to tell you all, in case you didn't know this, I'm kind of a theology nerd, right? You know this about me. Not, not all priests are theology nerds. I am, okay? It's a fact. Some of you are theology nerds too. It's okay. You don't have to hide. And I get excited when I hear, like, especially some of the scripture scholars today, and I'm talking about guys like Scott Hahn and Brant Petrie and, and John Bergsma, and when I'm reading, they're giving me lectures on the Old Testament, and they, and they point out something to me in the Old Testament that points to Jesus, and I'm like, ooh, ooh, I've never seen that one before, that's really exciting, you know, and I get up my highlighter and start making notes. These people on the road to Emmaus, they had Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus, the Word of God himself made incarnate, and he's explaining all of this to them on the way. You know, they said that their hearts were burning in the good way, not in the way that it does when I have pizza at 12 a.m., you know. They're on fire. Because he's not just teaching and rebuking and correcting, but he's inspiring them with the living and active Word of God, which we would hope inspires a change in them. And I suspect that it does because of what happens next. First of all, they ask him to stay, which I think is so beautiful because if you remember uh, early on in the whole passion narrative, Jesus is begging the disciples to stay with him. And they choose instead to run away, to hide, out of fear, out of doubt, out of the same things that these folks are struggling with. Out of the same things that you and I struggle with, our own doubts, our own fears, our own insecurities. And now, Jesus enters the house with them. And what does he do? Something very, very familiar. He takes bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to them. And then, all of a sudden, their eyes are opened. They realize that this is Jesus. And he vanishes. Now, why does he vanish? Is it because he was a force ghost? It's because it wasn't really the risen Jesus, because they were just remembering him and the breaking of the bread. No, because he appeared to the other apostles too, who saw him, touched him, poked him, prodded him, who watched him eat and drink to show that he was truly resurrected. But in this sense, Luke wants to communicate to us that Jesus is present in the Eucharist of his church, assumed, if you will, at this point, into the mission of the church. And what happened to these two, these two people? Did they continue on to Emmaus wandering out of nowhere? No. They went back to Jerusalem. They returned to the eleven. They went to the church. They went to Peter. They were in communion with Christ's church. And they went to share with the church what Christ had revealed to them. And how he had made himself known through the celebration of the Eucharist, the breaking of the bread, as it was often called in the early church. As you see it called all the time in the Acts of the Apostles. By the way, guess who wrote the Acts of the Apostles? St. Luke. Oh. So, Jesus proclaims the Scriptures to them, which hopefully comes alive in their hearts, and then they see him and recognize him in the breaking of the bread. I hope that sounds very familiar to all of us gathered in the church today because it's exactly what we're doing right now. So no matter where we are in life, whether we're full of errors or doubts, Doubt of God's love for us, doubt of the power of the resurrection of Jesus, doubt of who we are called to be in Christ. Whether we're just having one of those days where we're 
kind of full of ourselves or down on ourselves or upset or hurt or broken because of things other people have done to us, whether we're struggling with finding our place and our acceptance in the church, no matter what's going on, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, longs today to enter into this reality, to enter into our reality with us and to inspire us by his holy word and to give his very self to us in the Eucharist, his body, blood, soul, and divinity. The question is, my brothers and sisters, are we going to allow ourselves to see Jesus revealed to us in the breaking of the Eucharistic bread? And are we going to take our rightful place in the church among the body of his believers? Or are we going to continue wandering on to Emmaus as if the resurrection never happened?